Tēnā tātou katoa, kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunamu te moana, hei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i a tātou katoa. Kia ora koutou and welcome to this Now We Are 12 uh, webinar um, where we're going to be thinking and looking at our latest research about food insecurity and school engagement. Um, in Young People, hosted by the Growing Up in New Zealand study called Sarah Jane TNA. My name is Sarah Jane and I'm the Research Director of the Growing Up in New Zealand study and it's my pleasure to be able to facilitate our session today. We've got a really great um, lineup of presenters and panellists for, for you all here. Um, we've got colleagues from the Growing Up in New Zealand study who have been involved with our co-papa for a long time and who really believe in the vision of Aotearoa being the best place in the world for tamariki, rangatahi and, and their whānau. Um, and we're also really um, grateful to uh, provide um, uh, other colleagues, um, people who will be joining our panellists who are also working hard to ensure that um, young people's voices are, are heard in, in policy um, spaces. Our, our webinar today is going to be broken up into two parts. We're going to start with presentations from some of the members of the Growing Up in New Zealand team so you can um, learn a little bit more about the details um, of these papers and to think about what the research might mean um, from our perspective. And so of our presenters today, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Gerritsen, who's a Senior Research Fellow with the Growing Up in New Zealand study here at Waipapa Taumataro, the University of Auckland. Sarah's going to take us all through um, the research that she's undertaken looking at patterns of food insecurity at 12 years of age and how this has changed over time including um, some really interesting information, I think, about the role of the Food and Schools programme. Then our second speaker um, is Molly Grant, who is a research assistant and PhD candidate um, with Growing Up in New Zealand and Wai Papa Taumataro. Molly's been working uh, within the education domain and um, in her paper, she is going to help us understand um, what some of the factors are that enable positive school engagement for 12-year-olds. As I mentioned, we're really happy to provide um, some, some colleagues and panellists for a fuller discussion about what, what our research data might mean for policy and, and for um, uh, advocate, advocates. And so um, I'll be introducing those panellists closer to the time and we're really grateful for their involvement. Our Growing Up in New Zealand team are working in the background. So um, if you have any questions about the work we've been doing, about the papers, that are on our website. Um, uh, or if you've got questions for any of our speakers today, please use the Q&A function. We will try and respond to them uh, live during this session, um, but I'll also try and keep a bit of time towards the end of the webinar to answer some, some questions for you while we're all together. And so before I hand over to Sarah to, um, to start her presentation, I thought I'd give you all a little bit of context about the Growing Up in New Zealand study. Hopefully many of you know that Growing Up in New Zealand is Aotearoa's largest contemporary longitudinal study of child and youth wellbeing. Participants in our um, study were recruited back in 2009 and 2010 during their mother's pregnancy and the team have been following um, the cohort since this time. The work you're going to hear about today um, comes from our most recent data collection wave, the 12-year DCW which started in the second half of 2021, just after the Omicron outbreak sent us all into a level four lockdown. Despite the challenges that that environment presented for many of us in the team, but also our, our cohorts, their whanau and, and their communities, we're really proud to have completed um, online interviews with four and a half thousand young people aged 12 years of age, and who also reflect the expansive ethnic and gender identities of young people who are living and growing up in Aotearoa. So with that bit of context in mind, it's my pleasure to hand over to our first presenter for today, Dr. Sarah Gerritsen. Kia ora, Sarah. Kia ora, thanks, Sarah-Jane, and kia ora koutou. Um, it's 
Well, I have the pleasure of leading the Growing Up in New Zealand Now We Are 12 report on food insecurity. Um, food insecurity is the limited or uncertain availability of nutritional food needed for healthy growth and development of children. Or it might be the limited availability of, of food to be obtained in a socially acceptable way. So for example, resorting to food parcels or borrowing money for food. Um, in this report, we investigated the change in food insecurity among the cohort families, asking mothers of the children the same eight item questions that the government uses to monitor food insecurity. And we also looked at uh, which families were receiving different types of government support, including school food program access. So in this presentation, I'm going to share with you four main findings from the report and then conclude with the policy implications of those findings. So firstly, we'll start with what's changed during the last two data collection waves. A strength of the growing up in New Zealand study is that we follow the same families over time. So we can see what's happening um, for them through different um, time periods. We measured food insecurity among the cohort families when the cohort were around eight years of age. So that was 2017-19 um, through to 19. And then again, when they were 12 years of age in 2021-22. So we can see in this um, figure here that the overall proportion of families who were food secure, that's the green um, at both points, and food insecure, that's the blue at both points, um, didn't actually change that much between these two time periods. The grey um, down the bottom there shows the families that we couldn't get information from at each of those data collection wave. So that's that the mother didn't answer the questionnaire. Um, what we can see here though is that there is movement for some families between the data collection waves. So we've got some families going from being food secure in the green to food insecure in blue, and some families went from food insecure in blue to food secure in the green. Um, and in fact, these proportions moving in and out of food insecurity are quite similar. So despite the macro changes that were affecting everyone, such as the pandemic during this um, time period, there were most likely actually some micro household level circumstances that were creating the conditions for movement in and out of food insecurity. And that's going to be really important um, area for further research with this data. Okay, next slide, Molly. Um, the next main finding was around um, the use of special food grants from WINS um, and food bank use. So this table shows the number and proportions in brackets underneath um, of the mothers who answered that they never, sometimes or often experienced these different key indicators of food insecurity. The tables ordered so that the top indicators there are the most frequently experienced um, through towards the bottom are the least frequently experienced indicators. So for example, we see around a quarter of households at eight and 12 years of age um, were sometimes limited in the variety of foods that they were um, able to eat due to a lack of money. Now that didn't necessarily mean they were food insecure. They had to meet the criteria for um, a lot of these indicators to be classified as food insecure, but it gives you an overall picture of these types of indicators that we're seeing in the population. And then you've got the further around four and a half percent who often had food variety limitations in that first row. Yeah. The last column of the table shows that the only indicator in the list that changed over that four year period was um, between when the cohort were eight and 12 years of age was the use of special food grants and food banks, because we know that the availability of these went up during the pandemic period. Um, although there's are still pretty small proportions overall who are um, using food banks um, and the food grants. So it's gone from 6% in around 2017, 19 to 10% of our families at, at 12 years of age. Whether or not that's small is actually a little bit um, up to each. Yeah, 10% is still quite a lot. Um, the third main insight from this data was around government financial assistance. Um, and really, we uncovered that it's generally not enough um, to move families out of food insecurity. So about 10% of growing up's families receive a main benefit. That's a job seeker or sole parent support uh, or a supported living payment. 
and half of families receiving a main benefit at eight and 12 years of age were classified as food insecure. So that suggests these payments are not enough to ensure food security for this, these whānau. In fact, some of the families on main benefits, 17.5% of them, went from being food secure at eight years of age to food insecure at 12 years of age. So this finding that main benefits are not enough to secure um, food for these families um, really corresponds with other research on the high cost of food and family budgets. However, what we also found with our data was that it was better for families to be receiving government support than none at all. So there are families in our um, cohort that were food insecure at eight years of age um, that didn't receive any government support. And they had double the chance of moving to, oh, sorry, the ones that were receiving government support had double the chance of moving to food security by 12 years of age compared to those who received no government assistance at all. And this um, stands for all types of government assistance. So the main benefits, working for families, tax credits, and um, ka ora ka ako, the receipt of the school food lunch program. So in all of those instances, families were twice as likely to stay food insecure if they didn't receive that support. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Molly. The last insight um, I'm going to share with you today was around the food programs in schools. Um, as a public health nutritionist, I was really pleased to see the large number of children with access to healthy food through these programs, um, ensuring that they receive the nutrition they need to thrive at school. Um, there's a lot more detail in the report if you're interested in this area. Uh, but the key takeaway from me was really that there's a lot of children um, that experience food insecurity at 12 years of age who weren't receiving food at school. So the graph in the top left of this slide shows the proportion of children experiencing severe food insecurity in the dark blue and moderate food insecurity in the lighter blue. Gray is that they live in food secure homes. Um, and it's by school decile, so, or merged into quintiles. So the old school decile one and two are collapsed into the first row there. So those are the least advantaged schools. You can see they have the highest proportion of children experiencing food insecurity. But there are children throughout the schooling system with food insecurity at home. So Ka Ora Ka Ako is our largest um, school food program following a pilot. It was rolled out nationally as part of the COVID recovery package to the bottom 25% of schools in the equity index, um, which is the new school decile system. And so now over 220,000 children and young people receive lunch every day at school through Ka Ora Ka Ako. When we look at the table in the bottom right there, we can see 40% of children with severe food insecurity and over half of those with moderate food insecurity weren't eligible or they were attending schools that didn't receive Ka Ora Ka Ako. So because that program's only eligible in those schools in areas with the greatest socioeconomic barriers, um, it appears it's leaving out a lot of children who live in other areas and could benefit from the program. So in conclusion, um, next slide, Molly. Yeah, the targeting of Ka Ora Ka Ako and other community food-based um, programs or, or the community-based food programs in schools, sorry, um, are missing a lot of children who have food insecurity at home. And additionally, the government financial support for families is not enough to keep families out of food insecurity. Uh, in this paper, we recommend that the number of eligible schools for Ka Ora Ka Ako is increased. And given the large number of Māori and Pacifica families affected by food insecurity, um, which is data I haven't presented today, but is available in the online report, um, the policy responses should be tailored towards and led by these communities. So kia ora, I'm going to pass over to my colleague uh, Molly Dowd, who's going to tell us about the school engagement findings. Kia ora Sarah, uh, tēnā koutou kato, ko Molly Grant tōku ingoa no Whanganui Atara Aho. I will be, um, oh sorry, let me just get this slide working. 
Uh, thank you for that great presentation, Sarah. Um, I think that transitions quite nicely into the report on school engagement, um, particularly because we know that the factors within young people's uh, school, but also uh, family context does influence uh, their learning and schooling experiences as well. I will be presenting some of the key findings uh, that are in the school engagement report today, but before I do so, I want to acknowledge my co-authors on this paper, and in particular, uh, Josie Tate, who is the lead author and unfortunately is off sick today. For the school engagement report, we were really interested in investigating who was engaged in, in school at the 12-year time point. We also wanted to know how emotional school engagement had changed for the young people since they were eight years old. And then lastly, we were interested in what are the contextual factors that enhance school engagement at the 12 year time point. So for the 12 year data collection wave, we uh, went to the young people themselves and uh, collected really rich data on their school engagement experiences. So we asked them 17 different questions on school engagement, and these questions focused uh, on young people's attitudes and feelings towards school, the actions that they take in the classroom um, and in their learning, and then also what they think about their learning. And so we took these 17 different questions and we aggregated them. And so each of the young people in the cohort now have a school engagement score. And this score ranges from one, which represents lowered school engagement, right through to five, which represents uh, higher school engagement. And so the first finding that I want to share with you today is the distribution of these school engagement scores. And so you can see in this figure uh, down in the bottom left hand side that at age 12, uh, this is the distribution of school engagement scores. So we see that there are very few of the young people who scored a one, which uh, represents lowered school engagement, and much more um, of the cohort who are um, reporting positive school engagement scores. So we had an average score of around 3.76. And you can see that the midpoint in the scale is three. So uh, that really does tell us that in general, most young people are reporting really positive school engagement. We did uh, see, however, that 14% of the cohort, which is around one in seven of the young people, reported below that midpoint. So that represents that these young people are reporting lowered school engagement. We were really interested in um, understanding the experiences um, of the cohort, of different groups within the cohort, sorry. And so I'll just share a few examples of uh, the investigation that we did into different um, socio-demographic groups. So we can see that this figure here represents the school engagement scores by gender, and that uh, on average, cisgender girls reported the highest levels of school engagement whereas transgender, non-binary, and those young people who were unsure of their gender, uh, they reported the lowest school engagement scores on average. And so these um, patterns that you see in this graph, they held across all the different uh, ethnic groups. And then when we looked at ethnicity just on its own, uh, we saw that Asian young people had the highest levels of school engagement and that Rangatahi Māori had on average the lowest school engagement scores. We also investigated school engagement across um, additional learning needs. And you can see from this graph, we have on the far left-hand side, our group who had no additional learning need identified. So we went to the mothers of the cohort and we asked them to indicate whether their young person had been identified as having an additional learning need. And then you can see that we've grouped um, that data into different learning needs um, across that graph there. Uh, we found, so we compared the different learning need groups to um, see if the school engagement uh, scores of these groups were different from the young people who identified as having no additional learning need. And we found that compared to young people with no additional learning needs, that young people with autism, ADHD, emotional or behavioral problems, and also those requiring extra subject specific support had on average lower school engagement scores than those with no additional learning needs. 
This was also the case for young people um, who had a specific learning disability. So that's our young people, for example, who have dyslexia. The Growing Up in New Zealand data, um, sorry, the Growing Up in New Zealand study has collected data from across um, the young people's childhood. And so now we have three different data um, time points where we have emotional school engagement um, information. And so you can see from this figure here that at age eight, um, young people's emotional school engagement, so that's um, whether young people are liking school, whether they're enjoying school, and also whether they're interested in school. We can see that that is um, quite high at the eight-year time point, represented in that dark blue distribution there. The light blue distribution represents um, emotional school engagement scores at the lockdown time point. And so this was around May 2020, quite early on in the pandemic, when a lot of the young people were learning from home. We can see that compared to the distribution at age eight, that those um, school engagement scores have shifted quite substantially down towards the lower end of the scale. The light green uh, distribution there is our 12 year time point, our most recent time point. And so we can see that um, from the lockdown time point when the young people were about 10 years of age, we see some recovery towards more positive school engagement um, experiences. Um, however, not to the same degree as was at eight. And then the final insight that I want to share with you, um, I mentioned earlier that we were really interested in looking at the contextual factors that were associated with school engagement. And so um, we looked at factors within the young people's school environment, um, within their family environment, and then also um, individual level factors as well to see what was associated with school engagement, um, particularly what enhanced school engagement at the 12 year time point. And so this um, infographic here is just a visual representation of our multiple regression model. And so what this tells us is that the green bubbles represent factors within uh, the young people's environments that were positively associated with school engagement. Um, so if we take student teacher relationships, for example, that's uh, represented in the largest bubble size here, uh, which tells us that this factor had the strongest positive association with school engagement scores at the 12 year time point. And so what this tells us is that when young people report that they have a respectful relationship within teacher, they have one where they are um, in a strong caring relationship with their teacher and they view that relationship quite positively, that that enhances school engagement um, and that they're more likely to have higher school engagement scores. We also see uh, similar findings for academic efficacy. And academic efficacy really represents um, students' beliefs about themselves as learners, uh, whether they believe that they can succeed um, in, at school and in their learning. Differently, we see in the blue bubbles uh, negative associations with school engagement. And so we see that um, of those um, factors that had negative associations with school engagement, that depressive symptoms um, had the strongest negative association with school engagement. So the higher uh, number of depressive symptoms that young people were reporting um, was yeah, negatively or more likely to mean that those young people had lowered school engagement. In terms of what these uh, findings mean for policy and practice, um, I'll just touch on a few different points, but I know that we have our experts on the panel who will be able to give some more context to these findings in a moment. One of the main takeaways uh, from these findings is that providing school environments where students feel safe, where they feel included and where they see their individual identities, but also their cultural um, identities reflected in the school context, um, that they, this kind of inclusive environment is really essential for promoting school engagement. Secondly, the findings highlight the importance of the student-teacher relationship and students also having belief in themselves to succeed within the school context. We also recommend that promoting whole school approaches that enhance inclusive and responsive environments is really important, particularly because we saw that certain groups of young people had lower school engagement uh, than others. 
And then finally, uh, because young people spend a lot of time in uh, the school environment, this means that schools are really well positioned to provide interventions for mental health problems and to also support students' well-being. That's all uh, from me. I'll hand over now to Sarah Jane, who will introduce our panel. Hilda, Molly, and thanks to you and Sarah for your great presentations and your and your work on behalf of growing up in New Zealand. Yes, so it's my, my pleasure now to introduce you to our colleagues and experts um, who are here as part of our panel this afternoon. Um, so first up, I'm going to introduce Associate Professor uh, Lisa Te Morenga. Lisa has iwi affiliations to Ngāpuhi, Ngāti Whātua and Te Rarawa. Um, she specialises in the role of diet and the treatment and prevention of obesity, diabetes and cardiovascular disease, um, with particular interests in nutrition and hauora Māori. Lisa is also the co-chair of Health Coalition Aotearoa, which aims to provide a collective voice and expert support for effective policies and actions to reduce the harm from tobacco, alcohol and unhealthy foods, and to reduce inequities through a focus on the determinants of health. Next, we have Robin Cagle, who is the Chief Education Advisor at the Ministry of Education, with responsibilities in the areas of curriculum and assessment. Robin has worked closely with the Growing Up in New Zealand team over the years, and I'm really looking forward to hearing how she sees the value of the 12-year um, data supporting some of the work that is being led by um, the Ministry of Education. Thirdly, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kane Meisel, who is a colleague at Growing Up in New Zealand and, and named investigator with the study. Kane is also a senior lecturer in educational psychology in the School of Learning, Development and Professional Practice at the Faculty of Education and Social Work at the University of Auckland, Waipapa Taumataro. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Fennerty, who is also a named investigator at Growing Up. His background is in community psychology, which pivots around youth well-being, particularly as it is impacted by victimisation, harassment and also heteronormativity, including within schooling and education settings. John's interested in a range of topics that are about promoting social justice, equality of opportunity and equity. So again, my thanks to everyone for being part of this panel. Um, Robin, kia ora. I wonder if I could come to you first, please, and ask if you might share with us all here today on the webinar, um, was there one thing or one or two things that surprised you or inspired you from the analysis um, that the Growing Up in New Zealand team um, did to look at positive school engagement within this cohort? Um, kia ora. Thank you so much for sharing your findings with us. Um, I felt intuitively that I... Um, expected some of these findings, um, but I think that the, the longitudinal nature of the data is also extremely useful for us, um, such as knowing that school engagement had improved since early in the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, that was really useful, um, and, but that it was um, still lower at age 12 than it had been at age 8, for example. Um, the other thing that I was really interested in was that insight from the food insecurity report um, about about changes over time in food insecurity within households and I thought that was really interesting seeing that you know some moved in and some moved out of being food insecure over time um, of course that kind of does make sense when we know about the context that the families went through but it's really useful to have that that data as well and I think that'll be useful for us to consider in our policy context so thank you very much Kilda, Robin, and that is one of um, the really important goals of the Growing Up in New Zealand study is to make sure that um, the data and information we collect as a study doesn't sit idle, um, that we're finding ways that we can share it with researchers, policy and advocates to, to really make sure that we're working together to transform wellbeing outcomes for, for Rangatahi. Lisa, kia ora. Um, thanks for being here today. I wonder your thoughts, please. Any did anything here surprise you around the food insecurity um, findings and, you know, what, what are your thoughts on what we all need to be know, doing next to really shift the dial around food and nutrition and, and public health?
I don't have my <laughs> on mute. Um, sadly, I'm not really surprised that a lot of families are experiencing food insecurity and that this hasn't changed substantially over the waves of um, the last two waves there. Although it's interesting to see some families moving in and out, but we just haven't had good policy I guess that tackles the high cost of food and the difficulty that many families have in affording healthy nutritious food that's going to set our kids up for life so um, yeah disappointing it shows that we still have a lot of advocacy <laughs> a lot of um, pressure to put on our governments to ensure that families do have enough to eat um, the Although small numbers of families are experiencing severe food insecurity, one thing I'm concerned about is the number of families who's, who are limited in the variety of foods that they're able to um, purchase because we know that that's more likely to be healthy fruits and vegetables and the nutritious foods that will really set our tamariki up for long, healthy adult lives. So... Kilda, Lisa, yeah, I think that's that is um, that tends to be the response, particularly for people who work in equity spaces, and and focus on the the priorities of population groups that are are getting less. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing where we get to in this conversation about what 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 difference could we make, what what arguments um, do we need to make next, and how to how does the growing up in New Zealand um, papers and, and data support uh, um, maybe a change in approach for all of us. Kelda Kane, um, you know, I've, I've been thinking about these two papers and we did want to bring these two particular papers together in one webinar because I think schools are a really important site for supporting young people in, in their whānau. Um, so I know you work particularly with Josie and Molly on, on that, um, that particular education paper. Does anything surprise you? anymore um, or are you inspired to do something differently in your your next research uh, papers? Kia ora Sarah Jane, um, thank you. I like Robin really, I, I think one of the things that's sort of both surprising and unsurprising is that the results were broadly in line with what we expected so um, particularly the the results around academic self-efficacy um, and the importance of, of actually believing in yourself as, as a student. Um, the other thing that, that stood out as, as really important was, again, student-teacher relationships. And I think what's really important about that is that the young people themselves are sort of emphasizing and reinforcing um, a lot of the other research that, that we have internationally that sort of speaks to the importance of that relationship um, more from the sort of parent and teacher um, perspective more often than from the student themselves. So I think that's a really cool aspect of it. Um, and like, like Robin said, I think it's really reassuring to see that recovery that, that we um, observe in student engagement relative to, to the COVID um, lockdown survey in 2020. But I do think one of the things that's a little bit surprising relative to um, the, the sort of pre-COVID international research is that in, in general, we do sort of expect to see a bit of an age-related decline in student engagement but there's quite a lot more variability than what I would um, have expected um, based on that sort of earlier research. So I think that's something that really warrants further attention. Um, and just one of the things that I guess was quite a surprise was normally we, we um, expect to see quite negative associations between things like severe material hardship um, and things like school engagement. Um, but in this particular instance, we didn't see that pattern, which was a little bit of a surprise and, and really um, sort of sent us down a few different um, avenues and, and paths to, to look at why that might be. And our current thinking is that um, it, it may well re uh, represent and reflect the, the resources that young people are drawing on from within their communities. Um, so particularly things like social support but in saying that, we, we need to sort of be mindful that it doesn't negate the potentially harmful effects of hardship. So we sort of want to look at that a lot more closely as well to understand that in more detail. Kilda Kane. Um, Kilda John, 
I'm, I'm wondering your your work, um, both through research and, and directly with Rainbow Communities, has been really informative in how a lot of our Now We Are 12 work has, has shaped up. Um, so yes, there is a question about anything surprising for you, um, perhaps through Molly and Josie's work, but I'm also interested in this idea around how we support um, learners to, to believe in themselves in the context of um, environments that don't believe in, in young people and, and their potential. I wonder, you can take either of those, those questions. What do you think we could do to support our, our rainbow young people? Kia ora e hoa. thank you so much. Um, and Kane, really excellent to hear your reflections, um, which align with lots of those surprises for me. And that one that did, of course, stand out for me really starkly was those overall group differences for the trans non-binary um, young people and those who are currently unsure of their gender. And I think just seeing the starkness of, of that difference was really confronting. Um, again, not entirely surprising. And, um, you know, because we know from other research that um, this group of young people are likely to face more challenges. Although not all of them will face those challenges, there's definitely a substantial number there that I think is a real cause for concern and really does emphasize that need to ensure that those school environments are supportive and inclusive and and embody that whole school approach that Molly um, outlined. And that's that's no small feat given um, some of the rising anti-trans, um, transphobic sentiment that um, we currently face in our community. And then to dovetail into your other part type, Sarah Jane, I think around what is it that can we can do to promote that academic self-efficacy um, the work that's being done around addressing bias, um, particularly around kind of teacher bias towards particular students, uh, expectations that student that teachers have of akonga and learners um, that needs to be um, really high, um, I think is really important. But some of the stuff that's in the report um, details more detail around how we can produce learning environments that reflect the particular needs and learning styles of different groups in our society so that we move away from, from some of the more one size fits all approach. I think that stuff is really useful, kind of thinking about how we can support teachers in schools to teach in ways that enable um, a variety of people with different ways of being in the world to, to see themselves succeed um, in their learning. Those are some whakaro for me. Kia ora. Kia ora, John. Um, um, a lot of what you said sort of resonates with me working predominantly in health spaces around um, cultural safety approaches and the importance of um, addressing some of the structural issues, as well as supporting the people who work in those structures and systems to be responsive to, in this case, um, learners in Akonga. I wonder, Robin and, and Lisa, so... Um, you know, Sarah's great paper and, and one of the recommendations that came out about how we might um, build on some of the successes of these food school programs, but ensure that they're getting to um, perhaps to more students or to the right communities, that the people who rely on these programs until such time as, as we might be able to um, enable families to be able to, to have um, their rights to healthy food and nutrition being met. Any any up coming work or, um, or programs that um, you see coming through the, the pipeline that this growing up in New Zealand data might be um, able to leverage for you? Oh, that sounds like a question for Robin, who might um, know what's going on in the education sector. Um, yes, I was going to mention that um, there's been 323 million um, provided to fund the Ka Ora Ka Ako um, program through for the 2024 uh, school year. But finding the funding is always an exciting, <laughs> exciting thing to do. So, so we'll continue at least um, for for the 2024 school year and 
the evidence that you've provided um, for us will um, help us uh, for our some of our longer term goals around that. And I think that's um, particularly because we know from research that some of the impacts of these food programs take a wee bit of time to come through and to be seen, you know, in people's lives. You can see some very quick, immediate ones like they're getting some nutritious food, but some of those longer term impacts um, we won't see for a wee bit of time necessarily in some of these learners. So being able to have the information from you guys over time too is going to help us um, to be able to say just how well this is doing for those learners that are getting it. We found the Growing Up in New Zealand uh, data helpful in our campaign to um, seek up Oraka Ako expanded. So Health, Health Coalition Aotearoa, um, prior to the budget, we're really pushing hard to um, see the program doubled to at least 50% of children. And that number was really based largely on the on the data that you were showing that a large number of children in um, who were experiencing moderate to severe food insecurity were at schools that weren't receiving that project. Although we didn't get that as a win, I think it's a win that we saw an expansion of the, I mean, a, a continuation of the program for at least another year. So I'll take that as a little win because I think it's really important to those kids that are getting it. I do really worry um, about the risk that the program has taken away because it's become very important, I believe, to a lot of the schools that are receiving these projects. Um, I mean, this program, um, and I think that could be quite devastating to the families and the kids that are receive, receiving the lunches, but also the um, industry, the, the businesses and the communities that have grown up around providing the food and I think have a really important role in the community. I think that, um, you know, the food insecurity data gives us some really emotive um, evidence there to promote a program that I think goes beyond just feeding needy families. So um, we'll be looking at what we can take out of your data to keep pushing for it to be expanded to more families, because it's not just about um, feeding hungry kids, <laughs> it's getting kids good quality food. And I think taking pressure off families as well. Um, I would have loved my kids to go to a school where I didn't have to make lunches or make sure they got food every day. Um, I, I, I think that could be a universal benefit for a lot of families. So we'll be looking to push that message so that we can sort of deflate those arguments that you get that why should we be supporting kids who don't need it? You know, I, I think all kids would benefit from a program like this. Yeah, Kilda, Lisa, I'm I'm with you. Not having to make a school lunchbox, but also the the um the confidence that are provided to whānau when they know that their the young people and children are, are are being provided this program. I think is really important in a in a service we can be offering them. Um, Kane, I I wonder. I know in other parts of your your academic role, you work closely with um with teachers. Um, who are looking, you know, to come to university and, and further their own their own development. Um, you know, the findings around the importance of that student-teacher relationship, I think, are really um, are really beautiful to see. And your point that you know the literature suggests that these these things drop off. Um, you know, that that measure tends to take a, a, a downward dip as the young people um, become older. I, I wonder whether or not you have any reflections on, on the conversations you have with teachers in your academic role and then the contribution that we can make to support strong relationships between teachers and students, you know, once they're into those, um, those secondary school environments, what can we all be doing to support that as a key relationship? Yeah, so I think um, just, just one thing to clarify, that so the international literature shows a drop in student engagement um, with that that's associated with age but not not in the not a related drop in the importance of the student teacher relationship so most of the research um in that space is really consistent that over and over again ev every time there's there's research that looks at um the the student teacher relationship we see that that's important it is important for student engagement even if it, it might be sort of 
alongside things um, be, be uh, maybe dropping off a little bit. And there has been there's been quite a lot of work um, that looks at how to understand that and contextualize it and and build it up and continue to support it. Um, and it's still something that I would say is not super well understood. But um, I'll just I'll pivot away for a moment to the to the student teacher relationship because the research in that space is much more consistent. And I think the, there's quite a history of really um, interesting and and quite um, impactful research that that focuses on the student teacher relationship within the Aotearoa New Zealand context specifically. Um, so our research really sort of builds on that, but there's some real kind of giants within this space that have um, identified the um, criticality of, of that import, um, of that relationship, particularly for Māori and Pacific young people. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of the warmth and that feeling of um, belonging and space and inclusivity and all of those sorts of things that John um, mentioned as well, um, really get facilitated and supported by having someone in your corner, um, having a teacher that believes in you and shows that you, that you should really believe in yourself as well um, is just so important. Kia ora, Kane. John, um, you know, I'm, I'm mindful also of that as well as supporting the Growing Up in New Zealand study, you, you've been involved with the um, youth survey series as, as well. And as our as our cohorts are heading into these, these adolescent years, and, and the, I wonder about um, your other experiences around creating these safe, inclusive environments for, for rainbow young people during adolescence, the importance of that for their other aspects of, of their well-being. Um, yeah, and, and building on that reflection around the student-teacher relationship, what, um, what you'll find in the broader report, if you look at it, is that we found that that um, association of lowered school engagement for trans, non-binary and young people who are questioning their gender disappeared when we accounted for those other aspects in the model. And that really talks to the power of that teacher-student relationship, particularly for trans and non-binary young people. And that's actually something we see a lot. Um, and many of those young people uh, may experience less than ideal um, support um, at home and in the community. And it makes schools an even more important critical environment um, as a resource really to support those young people to have positive engagement across the community. And we know also, um, from, from that Youth 2000 work that we've done, that um, students who are at schools, rainbow students who are at schools where teachers have high expectations of them, where they belong, they are more likely to achieve um, than students, rainbow students who don't have a sense of belonging and um, don't have teachers who believe in them. Um, and that's really important, not only for achievement, because it's important that people can succeed to their abilities, but we also know that if people achieve at school, they're actually less likely to have negative health outcomes later on in life. And so there are a range of reasons why we really want to support schools to do this well. And it's great that the ministry has got the guide around supporting LGBTQIA plus students um, at schools. And, and I think that's really important. I think this our data also talks to the importance of this the kahikatea strategy supporting Māori engagement. We saw a small but nonetheless significant um, issue for Māori, rangatahi Māori around engagement and learning. And I think our data really emphasises that continued need to ensure that we reflect that, that Māori students are able to succeed and learn as Māori. And in relation to student hitch relationships, thinking about how we build that whanaungatanga between students and Akonga is going to be a really important and exciting kind of area, I think, for us to develop further. Yeah, kia ora, John. Thank you for raising that. I could see that there was what I thought was a great question in the Q&A from our colleague, Professor Terry Ann Clark and, and Lisa and Sarah, you, I think you were responding, but I wonder if we share it with the audience and if you could you could talk to um, your response, please, which um, my summary, um, apologies, TC, is what do we do about the fact that these programs exist during 
school terms are there um, while school is in session? How do we support whānau with their food and nutrition needs during school school holidays? Um, and I, I'd extend it to once they once they leave school, those food and security experience aren't just going to magically go away. Your your thoughts, Lisa and Sarah, please. Um, I one of the things we push in Health Coalition Aotearoa is not just ka ara, ka ora, ka ako expansion. We see that as something that could make an immediate, tangible, beneficial effect for families right now. But our number one push is for incomes um, that people can live on so that they can afford to buy healthy food. So we'll always be trying to um, or advocate for greater incomes. Uh, the University of Otago puts out a food cost survey every year. And at the most basic diet, they estimate that the cost of feeding a family of two adults and two children is about $273 a week. Um, and we are constantly reading stories of people who are making do on $100 or less a week after they've paid their rent. Um, so that's just not enough money for families to be able to sustain their families, even if they are getting the healthy school lunches. That issue of not getting the school lunches in the holidays, I think, is um, definitely something we need to be mindful of when we're pushing for this as a sole solution to helping families out there. And it's kind of why I, I like to also focus on the other benefits of getting lunch, that modelling of healthy foods, allowing children to try new things that they their families may not be able to afford risking purchasing. Well, you know, when your money's so tight, you want to make sure that every bit of food is eaten. So you're not going to buy something that the kids might refuse to eat. That would just be a risk. So those are benefits. And the modelling, eating food, seeing your other, your friends, um, other kids around you, eating foods can really help kids to try new things. So there's all those additional benefits. I think also some of the innovative schools, some of our, um, we'll be talking to a Manawariwa High School's been quite innovative in the way they're delivering their school lunches. And I think some of these schools are looking at how they can support families outside of the, um, the school terms as well. So it'd be interesting to talk to them <laughs> about what their solutions are. But yes, good question. Thanks. TC. Yeah, and I was just going to add, it was really heartening to see a lot of schools pivot during the lockdowns to making sure that Fano had food um, provided, even though the kids weren't coming to school. They, um, a lot of that food was redirected um, and carefully thought about, also through the fruit and fruit and schools program, which is another or fruit and vegetables. It's called now. Um, yeah, a lot of that food was redirected to Fano and Need. So I think. There's ways to do it, and um, certainly our communities are coming up with ways to support whānau um, outside of just the school environment. But like Lisa says, there's so many benefits of this program, and that's why, what, 90% of countries around the world have a food school program? Like Australia and New Zealand were one of the last to the party here, so um, there's, yeah, lots of good reasons to have one, but um, certainly for food insecurity, it means that schools are helping to identify those fano in need, um, and that can be beneficial outside of the school day too. So, kia ora, great question. Kia ora, kōrua. Um, thank you for for sharing your thoughts thoughts around that. Um, I'm mindful that we're getting close to the end of our webinar, and I've I've got one more question for the for the panelists, and I'll I'll check in the Q and A as well. But um, one of the things that we do in the Growing Up in New Zealand study is is ask our cohort, the the mothers, um, and now the the rangatahi themselves about their hopes and and dreams for the future. And so, just I'd like to check in with the panel, please. And before we end the session, ask if you'd each share your hope for for Aotearoa um, being the best place in the world to be a a child or a, a young person and so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you again Robin are you what what's your hope um for child and youth well-being or or for the the education system oh wow pick one hope and say it in a very short sentence I just I and as an ex-teacher um and now working for the ministry I just my my heart really wants kids to be able to be in school, to be happy and healthy and to be learning, you know, and that's, 
what more could we ask really? <laughs> um, and yeah, I spent my life in education wanting to make that happen. So that's my dream. Kilda Robin, that's that's fantastic. Um, for you, Lisa, what's what's your hope for for Aotearoa and for public public Hi. health and nutrition? <laughs> I'd like, um, you know, the country to heed the call of our former Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern for kindness um, and instead of worrying about whether parents should be the ones feeding their children or working harder or doing whatever that people just want the best for our children um, as a community and see that we all have a role in helping to make children happy and to feel loved, cared for, nurtured and able to be successful. Kilda, Lisa, Kane, for you, what's what's your hope for, for children and young people here in Aotearoa? I'm I'm gonna go back. <laughs> my my dream would be for um child and young person background to no longer be a predictor of outcomes. You know, so there there to be no association between the the, um, the the context in which you're born to have any sort of um, association with subsequent outcome. That would be my dream. Kelda, okay, Kane. And then finally to, to you, John, what's, what's your hope for the future? My hope is that we have schools that uh, enable all our konga to bring all of themselves to school and for us all to collectively benefit when we are all able to live in our own manner and really express that and be nurtured by it because I think collectively we can achieve so much more than if we run people down and put people into narrow little boxes so that's my my dream. Kia ora, John. And once again, I just want to thank thank all the all of the panelists for for their time today and for sharing those hopes. I think that's really um, important um, that we we do share those aspirations because I think they're a really um, important way for us to stay connected um, to the co-papa um, of growing up in New Zealand and, and to find a place where we can go off and use the work that we've heard about today to to keep moving towards that future. Um, I'm just before I send everyone off to the rest of the afternoon, I'm just going to um, talk a little bit more about um, what we're doing at, at Growing Up in New Zealand and how you might be able to use um, the data from the Now We're 12 data set and, and our previous data sets um, for your own work. So um, this has been our second webinar as part of our series this year. Um, I really do encourage you all to um, please register for um, our next sessions. Uh, next week, we will be hosting a session looking at mental well-being um, amongst the cohort at 12 years of age, and also a paper that's um, looked at uh, the worries and fears that young people have had related to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and some quite interesting modelling around their, their mental health as well. Um, we have other papers um, that are already available on our website that have spoken to the children and young people's um, ethnic and gender identities that have looked at um, material hardship. Um, and we'll be releasing more papers before the end of June. So if you're interested in spending a bit more time with us here at Growing Up in New Zealand, um, please register for those webinars and, and download, download the papers that are available for you um, on the website. Uh, Growing Up in New Zealand um, makes all of our data sets available to um, people like you here in the audience who have really important questions that are going to help push us closer to this vision of Aotearoa being the best place in the world to be a child or young person. The 12 year data set um, will be available for your research questions and your analysis um, towards the end of June. Um, so please keep an eye on our website um, when we will be um, releasing the date for, for a uh, data access workshop um, where you can learn a little bit more about the process that supports um, your application process and enables you to, to use um, any of the data sets that have been collected since the, before the children were born, right through until this data collection wave. Um, I really do believe in the power of data to help inform um, policies and programs and to support advocacy for children and, and um, youth wellbeing. Um, so please do consider um, 
uh, what opportunities you might have to, to use the data set to support that kaupapa. So with all of that administrative stuff out of the way, I want to once again thank our presenters today, particularly um, Molly, Josie, who couldn't be here, and Sarah for their presentations, our panellists for, for coming along and being part of the conversation, and for everyone out there in the webinar who I know care deeply about children and, and rangata here, here in Aotearoa, um, and to thank you for your time and your interest in growing up in New Zealand. Tēnā ratātou katoa. Kia ora.